So today I'm going to talk about a you know, gene therapy that we developed in the Department of Anesthesia um, called SENCAV, which just stands for synapsin-driven cavulin-1. Cavulin-1 is a membrane lipid wrap protein and cholesterol binding protein. Uh, just uh, before I go into that, I'll go a little bit of background of myself um, as Deborah covered it. Uh, did my BA at Georgetown studying the U.S. government. Uh, minoring in theology, uh, did a master's in marine science through USD, but down at Scripps in Jeff Graham's lab, um, shark physiologist, and then did my PhD in Paul Insel's lab in the Department of Pharmacology in um, molecular pathology, studying lipid rafts and cardiac systems, and then I moved over to the neurobiology at the VA with Piyush Patel, who's a neuroanesthesiologist. So one question I actually still ask myself is how does one go from government to biology? Um, well, you we think of the system that we all live in, it um, tends to be governed by a central body, the, whether people like it or dislike it, in Washington, D.C., and within that central body, you have certain laws or codes that uh, we hope runs a functional society. Uh, true can be saying, uh, said about a neuron, within a neuron uh, or a nerve cell, you have a nucleus, and within that nucleus, you have DNA. Um, so really the two of them are a very similar system overall, whether you have societal or cellular, um, you hope to maintain normal function, and when things go awry, you obviously have uh, disease uh, or a sociopathic uh, society. Um, so uh, I first started studying uh, elasmobranch fishes, which are sharks, skates, and stingrays. This is a heterodontous uh, horn shark, which you can find right here locally in Scripps. And I was studying the cardiac physiology of horn sharks, a very primitive heart where they only have one atrium, one ventricle. And while I was doing this research, um, I was also a technician in Kirk Hammond's lab, who's a cardiologist at the VA who does a lot of gene therapy for heart failure. So that led me to a better understanding of the mammalian heart. And um, that then, I want to understand how it functions and how it beats. So I started looking at more of the cells, the cardiac myocytes. And I did a PhD in Paul Insel's lab, trying to understand how lipid rafts regulate cardiac uh, contractility. And then that brought me into understanding the brain and how lipid rafts may play a role in organizing uh, neuroprotection uh, signaling as well as neuroplasticity leading to improved function. So when we study uh, the brain, one thing that we um, are well aware of now is that aging is one of the highest risks for neurodegeneration. And with a couple examples, if you look at Alzheimer's disease or Parkinson's as well as ALS uh, in the setting of AD, you have a decrease in hippocampal function, a loss of uh, synapses, a loss of neuroplasticity, and overall decrease in hippocampal volume. In fact, with uh, individuals that suffer from PTSD, especially coming back from war, there's MRI evidence that they actually have a decreased hippocampal volume. And as we age, we actually, our hippocampal volume shrinks. Uh, in the saying of uh, Parkinson's, you have a loss of dopaminergic neurons from the substantia nigra that actually uh, no longer can deposit dopamine into the striatum, resulting in um, motor and um, coordination problems. And then in the saying of ALS, you have a loss of corticospinal uh, motor neurons throughout the, in the, starting the motor cortex and then uh, resulting in a loss of uh, spinal nerves. Um, so one objective or goal we're trying to look at is to identify certain targets, uh, genetic targets that we can augment um, and whether or not we can then use these to promote functional neuroplasticity in the setting of CNS disease. So one target that um, we've been long time interested in is lipid rafts. Lipid rafts are uh, cholesterol-rich microdomains that have uh, very uh, saturated fatty acids, all the stuff you're not supposed to eat at McDonald's. Uh, that's actually what these membranes are made of. But what they also do is that they're very important for tr transducing the signal from the outside of the cell, inside the cell. Uh, one example would be uh, when, a, when a cell body or a, of a neuron is sending out a neuritic process, it needs to achieve its proper target. Um, especially uh, with an axon or, or dendrite, and the growth cone at the lean edge of that axon uh, needs to find its target. Well, lipid rafts are very important for the steering and guidance. Um, in fact, when you reduce cholesterol and you get rid of lipid rafts, you have aberrant um, axonal guidance. Um, so a very important thing we're trying to understand is how can we augment this uh, ability within the cell to 
not only cause neuronal growth, but also functional neuronal growth. And so this is one of the main uh, things that we're, we're focused on. Uh, caviolin is a protein that's found in lipid rafts. Tra traditionally, it was found in endothelial uh, and epithelial within the uh, gallbladder. And um, it's also in, uh, expressed in neurons, and it's very important for organizing pro-growth signaling uh, components, such as synaptic receptors like NMDA receptors and AMPA, and also involved in track B localization to lipid rafts and augmenting um, BDNF signaling. And a few studies that we conducted uh, a few years ago is that when you knock down caviolin with siRNA and primary cultures of neurons, you actually blunt uh, synaptic signaling and, and track B signaling. And that mice that actually have a global knockout of CAV1 have uh, accelerated aging. So um, what we decided to do is say, okay, if we did the opposite, what if we overexpress caviolin, but sp specifically in neurons by using a synapsin promoter, uh, CAV1 is uh, well known to be an oncogene, so we don't want to express this in, uh, in dividing cells. So by using a synapsin promoter and using a simple bioassay of CAV1 knockout neurons, these are neurons isolated from CAV1 knockout mice, and you see a nice increase in caviolin expression with a uh, synapsin caviolin construct. However, when you try to do this in CAV1 uh, knockout glia, you see no expression with syncav versus a uh, adenovirus that has a CMV promoter, which would be expressed in, in most cells. Uh, and then one of the most serendipitous findings was that when we left the vector um, on cells for three weeks, um, based on me actually forgetting about them in the, in the incubator, uh, we found that they grew like weeds. Um, and it was a very striking result. Uh, we're, at the time, we weren't sure if this was very functional, but they, um, these were post-mitotic neurons that grew um, quite a bit substantially over the control vector cells. So one thing we want to look at then is, is this growth also involved in, in normal signaling. Um, so what uh, same type of neurons overexpressing caviolin, we saw an increase in synaptic markers uh, as well as synaptic, postsynaptic proteins, as well as track B, uh, and then CTB, which is a cholerotoxin uh, probe that identifies lipid rafts. And then when we were to take these cells and actually stimulate with NMDA to stimulate uh, NMDA receptor, we saw augmentation of uh, synaptic signaling. And the same occurred with BDNF, was on increase in track B signaling, um, suggesting that we were augmenting uh, pro-growth and um, pro-survival signaling in these cells. Uh, another thing we wanted to look at, uh, I used to do a lot of research on cyclic AMP. Cyclic AMP is a very important second messenger for neuronal growth and plasticity. In fact, it's targeted in clinical trials using um, compounds like Rolopram, which are PD inhibitors, a PDE is an enzyme that breaks down cyclic AMP. And what we found that uh, overexpressing caviolin in neurons, we found uh, augmentation of dopaminergic as well as serotonergic signaling. Um, Forsglen is just a, a direct activator of dental cyclase, the enzyme that generates cyclic AMP. So this is an important uh, result because we were seeing that only after agonism did we see an increase in AMP. We did not see it elevated basally uh, because sickling AMP, too much of it can also result in, in apoptosis. So the next, um, uh, this is just a little summary of the different signaling events that we uh, saw in hands, the NMDA signaling, uh, track B signaling, as well as GPCR signaling that all uh, converge upon uh, cyclic AMP as well as CREB. So, uh, another uh, thing that we wanted to ask is, okay, is this um, result we see in vitro have any functional physiological significance? So we took an AAV9 uh, synapse and uh, caviolin and, and uh, delivered this to both adult and aged mice. These are uh, non-disease mice. These are uh, normal mice. And we found an increase in apical dendritic arborization in CA1 neurons in hippocampus as well as granular cell neurons in the dentate gyrus showing uh, structural arborization. Um, and then we looked at uh, electrophysiological uh, parameters by stimulating the CA3 Schaefer collateral axons and recording in these C same CA1 uh, apical dendrites and found augmentation and long-term potentiation, which is a hallmark of learning and memory in the brain and, and an indicator of synaptic strength. 
So the importance of, of these data were to show that the structural alterations we were seeing in the hippocampus uh, also resulted in functional neuroplasticity. Um, and so the, the next thing that we did, which was uh, very nice results when I found out, I was at jury duty at the time and, and um, never thought this would actually work, but uh, this was a double-blind study where we did fear conditioning. Um, if you're not familiar with fear conditioning tests, uh, it's equivalent to if you were going to a 7-Eleven or a bank and you see a robbery. Well, a week later when you go back into that context, you're going to freeze uh, because you're going to remember it. So it's almost a, uh, it's a, it's a fair uh, learning. And we only delivered the vector into the hippocampus, not to other parts of the brain. Um, well, when, when we looked at the contextual recall, so we put the animals back into the box where they had the adversive stimulus, um, they froze more. However, uh, when they were put into a different box with a cue, they showed no difference, and the, and the cue recall was more amygdala and prefrontal cortex based. Uh, that would be equivalent to if someone hears a shot uh, go off at a track meet who's been in war, they're going to freeze. So it's less hippocampal dependent. So we found that the, the structural and functional neuroplasticity uh, resulted also in a behavioral uh, phenotype um, showing improved learning and memory. Uh, another thing we just uh, recently published on this, that these same uh, CA3 uh, uh, Schaefer collateral axons showed increased myelination, um, which was a, a surprising finding when we did this on EM. Um, and uh, one thing that this could explain for is the increase in LTP, um, the increase in axonal conductance uh, could be explained for the fact that there was an, uh, an increase in myelination. Um, and one thing, you know, I think most people think of myelin in a disease state. We lose our myelin in certain um, motor neuron diseases. However, you can actually have an increase in myelin if you learn a new language or if you learn a new, um, uh, a new instrument. There's actually evidence of an increase in myelin. In fact, when rats are put into an enriched environment where they're learning, they show increased myelin. Um, so it's a very, much more dynamic process that, um, that MRI has kind of brought back, and in fact, the term is now considered myelin plasticity, is a very growing uh, term um, in, in the literature now. So another thing we have in our labs, we do traumatic brain injury, uh, a controlled cortical impact model, and I generate a transgenic animal, very similar to the vector. It's a SINCAT transgenic animal. It has around two to three-fold more caviolin in the neurons. And after subjecting this animal to um, CCI, two months later, we again did fear conditioning, and uh, both, all the animals showed the same learning with the, with the um, aversive cue or aversive uh, stimulus. And we bring them back into the contextual um, paradigm. We saw a decrease in the transgene negative that was subjected to TBI, while the SINCAB animal subjected to TBI had preserved uh, memory. Uh, one thing we don't know about this test is whether or not that animal showed a decrease in learning in the beginning because you can only do fair conditioning really one time. And so this is around two months. So the only thing we can say from this is that it was least preserved. Uh, we don't know if it was any regenerative. But when we did do a, um, a, um, a motor test where the mice hang uh, uh, upside down from a grid and you multiply the time by the body weight, uh, as you can see over here, you did see uh, a decrease in the beginning in the transgenic animal, but uh, they showed a, a recovery around 49 days later, which you didn't see in the transgene negative, suggesting that these animals originally were injured, but they had some type of regenerative capability with, uh, in their motor skill without anything other than uh, having more cavernal neurons. We did not do any therapy with them or any type of training. Uh, so uh, something like running wheel or some other tests may actually improve this even greater um, because whenever you think about any type of intervention, you, you always think about combinatorial approaches um, to try to bring out the best uh, of whatever your target is. Um, so one of the most, um, one of the more recent stuff that we haven't published on uh, is looking at the, the ability of SINCAV to potentially um, slow the process of neurodegeneration. So we obtained um, a ALS mouse model from, uh, through Martin Marcello from Don Cleveland's lab, and this is an SOD um, uh, mutation uh, of a, 
of a uh, enzyme that actually is a mutant and inactive, but it works as a scaffold and uh, pretty much in microglia increases the amount of reactive oxygen species production. And we crossed this with the SynCav animal, and what we found that there was a um, maintaining of body weight right when you start seeing the divergence in the SOD animal by itself, which is in the red box. And then we also saw an increase in lifespan, a median lifespan of around 29 to 30 days, albeit modest, it still was uh, living longer um, than the SOD by itself. And then we also saw uh, an increase in voluntary running wheel, uh, which is a really nice test because it's up to the mouse. It doesn't involve um, uh, someone actually handling the animal. They can stay in the cage for as long as they want, and they run at night on their own. And um, it simply just measures the amount of activity. So what we see was that there was an increase um, not only in, in running wheel, but also uh, probably the most important aspect is um, extra, you know, extra month of, of life. Um, and usually the body weight with longevity, they tend to go hand in hand because the animal obviously st stops eating, whether it's through motivation or inability to move around. Um, we also uh, looked at the motor neurons and the ventral horn. Uh, this is just a spinal cord cross section. You have the dorsal horn to your upper right and then the bottom right is ventral horn. And by using a stain for the alpha motor neurons, we saw a preservation in the double cross in both a thoracic as well as a lumbar section further down the, the uh, vertebrae. And this is just a quantitation of, of the uh, counts of the, of the neurons. Um, so again, this is just simply using a transgenic animal crossing with a well-known um, ALS model. So what if we were to deliver the gene uh, exogenously? Uh, and again, working with Martin Marcella, uh, who's here at the Sanford Consortium, uh, he has developed a subpeel uh, delivery to deliver, um, uh, whether it's stem cells or uh, genes of interest, uh, directly into the nerve fibers of the spinal cord. Uh, the peel membrane is actually wraps it like saran wrap. Um, so this allows you to get um, pretty much as close as possible uh, to your delivery. And what we found was uh, in the, the uh, SOD animal that received uh, the AV syn cab, uh, that they showed um, a significant difference in forelimb grip strength. Um, so at the point of divergence, uh, when you start seeing the pathology, these animals showed a stronger ability to hold on um, and eventually started uh, showing a, a decrease uh, later on. Uh, but we also found that they had maintained body weight. Uh, so uh, that was very promising that they're not losing the weight um, compared to the SOD uh, animal that received the control vector. Um, so these are, these are some promising results looking at more of a, a clinically relevant uh, approach to the disease. So uh, just to kind of reiterate some of the findings we had looking at the in vitro results, uh, increased structural and functional neuroplasticity, as well as improvements in, in learning and memory in age and adult mice. Um, and then we also found these transgenic uh, animals, SynCab was resilient to brain injury showed uh, ALS progress, uh, disease progression uh, or slowing of it, and then also um, exhibited um, preserved um, body weight and strength. Uh, so one thing we're trying to, um, trying to do is um, obviously look at this uh, in the setting of not only AD, ALS, and other diseases, but see if we can prolong uh, survival and uh, as, as many different indications as possible. So some of the applications, uh, as we talked about already, ALS, uh, AD, uh, tri-brain during spinal cord, um, which um, uh, right now are still major problems at the VA, uh, as most of you, I'm sure, know, and other forms of age-related neurodegeneration um, that are not included in, in these groups. Um, so when we look at AAB vectors and CNS uh, disorders, one question I think always comes up is, uh, is this realistic? Um, um, but when you go to, you know, clinicaltrials.gov, you'll see a variety of different uh, AAV vectors being tested for CNS disease. In fact, a, a recent approval by the FDA for the treatment of blindness, um, which is uh, approved using an AAV vector. Um, so I think the, um, the community is becoming a little bit more open-minded to, to taking chances at something that isn't just a small molecule that is much more devastating than a simple small molecule will, will um, will uh, attempt to try to fix. 
Uh, one thing that uh, about most of these vectors, um, one thing limit, limiting about AV vector is the size of your construct. Um, if you have a self complementary AV vector, you can only put in something around two kilobase a pair of sizes. Um, so some of the genes that are of interest that could be beneficial may be too big. Uh, one of the fortunate things about Cavillon and, and synapsin itself is that they're around one kilobase pairs, and our um, construct is neuron-specific. Uh, very few of these use a neuron-specific promoter, um, mainly based on the, the limitation of size of AV vectors. Uh, and just to reiterate the construct, um, this allows it for a cleaner system that we feel is limiting off-target effects, um, and also AV uh, vectors in general, um, they are probably the, the most sought after because of their ability to not have much um, off-target effects as well as very little immunogenicity response in the sense of an inflamed response. Um, but there's still obviously limitations to uh, these vectors. And just again, I uh, want to thank everybody who's been involved, the co-mentors who are in the Department of Anesthesiology. Uh, Piyush Patel, Dave Roth, and Hilma Patel. Uh, Tsushi Miyanahara, who uh, generates uh, a variety of vectors with different AV serotypes. And all the collaborators involved, Martin Marcel and Don Cleveland, for allowing us to test the uh, mouse and rat. And then, of course, the fellows who did all the work um, who have since left the lab. And, um, and I'll take any questions. Hello. So, any, anybody has any question? So, um, in your last slides, you were mentioning about some side effects or whatever. Could you elaborate? What What are you looking specifically for, um, aside from immunogenicity or whatever? But have you seen anything that would cause concern or something that you want to address earlier so that this could become a product uh, eventually? Yeah, so uh, for us, we haven't seen any. We did neuropathology on the brains where we delivered uh, for the mice that age, and we didn't see any gross anatomical changes, and actually had a neuropathologist from the um, Sanford Burnham look at it, and um, no gliomas and no, no, um, no sign of astrogliosis. And this was in the age animals, so they had had the vector at 12 months of age, and then at 24 months of age, we actually did uh, post-mortem you know, analysis, and there was no signs of that. We haven't looked at um, other organs like lung and liver. Liver is one of the biggest uh, problems you have to look at with any kind of viral vector, and that's one of the limitations. With, But we're hoping with the use of a, a neuron promoter that even if it gets to the liver, it shouldn't be expressed in any cells that don't recognize the synapsin promoter. Um, so for the uh, animal studies, was, was it a, the, the gene therapy done just once? And how long are the, are the genes expressed? That's a yeah, good question. So yeah, we only did one time injection uh, just to see if there was any physiological effect. We've never done a repeat injection. And um, that's always a tough question about how long is it expressed because when you harvest tissue, you don't know if you, you usually stop after a certain study to look at other things. If for the mice that we delivered it to 12 months of age at 24 months, so almost a year later, CAV expression was very high still. Um, and we don't know if that's from the AV vector itself or if CAV levels stayed high. CAV turnover is usually 12 to 14 hours, so if it had been degraded, it should have come back down by then. Uh, so I, I believe from that that the AV was still being expressed. But, um, but there is literature out there on, on how long AVs last. Uh, I just don't know off the top of my head. Uh, do you, are you planning on using any turning, turn on off technology for the vector? Yeah, so we do have a construct that is a, um, a doxycycline um, TET on off system where you can actually, um, you, can, you can put the vector in and then only turn it on when you give uh, doxycycline, and then you can uh, turn it off as soon as we remove it from the diet. So we're testing that right now. It works so far in cells, but a lot of things work in cells that don't work in vivo. A lot of it, too, is uh, delivery across the blood-brain barrier, so, um, but we're testing that yeah, right now, yeah. And then some other things we're doing is optogenetics with Todd Coleman, which, uh, which works well. It's just the penetration of light 
into the brain is something we need to work on. So. One more question, uh, and you, are you working or doing a collaboration with someone to look at combination therapies, like using this plus something else for, for example, for neuro, uh, neuro regeneration? Yes, yeah, so, um, so that's one thing I've actually put in a lot of the grants that I submit that um, seem to get triage all the time is, is to actually use uh, the vector and then combine it with something like a track B agonist. Uh, because if we're augmenting the track signaling, um, there are some synthetic uh, agonists out there that may work to even push it further. Um, and then also doing something like a, um, maybe a physical uh, therapy, uh, some type of rehab for, would be an individual that could actually physically do that, not everyone can. Um, so I'm looking at pharmacologic as well as some, some other um, rehab approaches that may, um, you know, especially if you look at something like um, a uh, orthopedic surgery and all that where someone's just had surgery and they have nerve damage, possibly in addition to the rehab, giving this could help regenerate neurons and maybe make recovery a little bit faster. Uh, I know that um, Peyton Manning, who the a quarterback who retired, that when he had major nerve damage, he was using stem cells that he believed worked. So obviously, um, they're open to this kind of concept, but, um, but yeah, that's one thing I'm trying to look at. Anybody else? No question? Okay. Thank Yes, yes. We're oh. going to have a, a networking session and uh, some drink and food, and uh, you can ask him, you know, specifically right. on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Right. Thank right. you so much for coming. We appreciate your support. Right. I hope to see you soon in the next one.